Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Why don't we begin with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving and gracious God, in this season of Lent, we ask that you accompany us to the cross and through to the resurrection. Help us to know of your love for us, the love that's told in the story we're about to share. Help us to see it in our daily lives. Give us the grace to show that love to other people. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, welcome everybody to Salvation 101. Salvation 101. We're all just beginners in salvation, right? Um, Just by way of introduction to what Salvation 101 might mean, why are we doing this? There have been many people who have come up to me after Mass and say, where do I start if I want to read the Bible? Where do I start to get to know what the Church teaches, what we believe? And I never really have a great answer to that. With the Bible, which I hope you all brought, Does everyone have their Bible? I have an extra one up here if someone needs it. No? It's a complicated book, right? The Bible means actually books, biblia. It's plural. Many, many things in here from a span of thousands of years, right? And they're edited and they're very complex. So where do you really start? Well, the answer as lived by practice, you just have to pick it up, you have to open it, and you have to start reading. You really just have to get familiar with what is there, even on the surface, before you can get to understand many of the subtleties, the nuances in Scripture. And so today, what we're going to do is go through a familiar list of things stories that you probably have already heard, but we're hopefully going to look at in a slightly different way. And what I'm going to propose to you throughout this whole mission, this three-night mission, is one particular theme or way to read Scripture. Creation, decreation, and re-creation. So this is kind of a sequence that describes many of God's salvific acts for us. He creates us. We introduce some sort of disorder, which we normally call sin. And God, like God wants to do, is just always there for us, wishing that we would want to be recreated. And so this theme, creation, decreation, recreation, hopefully will be a helpful kind of paradigm to read the Bible on your own, You'll be able to read a story and see where it fits in in that scheme. It's not always just one. Sometimes a story has all three of those components, but it's at least a helpful way of organizing our thoughts. There are many, many other ways to read Scripture, but this is one. So I'm proposing it to you throughout this three-night mission as a way to enter into what God has done for us, what we have done against God many times, and how he invites us back to do what he originally wanted and recreates us in the process. Now, this is because Lent, as we all know or should know, is a time of preparation. Preparation for what? Lent is a time of preparation for mission, right? Easter, we receive the Great Commission to go out and make disciples, to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, it's difficult to realize what that might look like in our daily lives, but it is our call, it's our mission. And so Lent really is a way of detaching ourselves from all that would hold us back from that mission. Easter is a time to celebrate the mission, and through the Ascension and Pentecost, when we receive in a very real way the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we are sent out to live that mission in our ordinary lives, day-to-day lives, week after week. So that's what Lent is about. And this mission, hopefully, will help us to prepare for 
the capital M mission that we receive anew at Easter. So I want to begin with just a basic overview of what I'm talking about tonight in the creation component. We'll talk about decreation mostly next session, and then the session after that, recreation. So here's my little vision. We're going to talk about creation tonight, covenant in particular. God creates the world. He creates a relationship, really, with the world and with all of us through Israel. Decreation, of course, sets in. We break that relationship. We run away from it. But tonight we're going to focus on what that relationship, that right relationship, really looks like. How God establishes that relationship. Next week we're going to talk about the prophets, especially, because they're the ones who call us to task on that original vision of God. They say, you've fallen from this. Time to get back. And then hopefully the third night, we'll finally get to the New Testament, which helps us to see that this is a plan that's been unfolding for many, many years. That God acting with his people is something that finds fulfillment in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so, you might have a question. What is covenant? What's covenant? We hear it a lot, right? What's covenant? Well, a covenant in the ancient world really is just a treaty. It's almost like a contract. saying It's between two parties, basically. Saying, if you don't kill me, I won't kill you. Right? It's pretty basic in those times. If you don't kill me, I won't kill you. We'll be in peace. Right? But it's establishing a sort of personal relationship with a tribe and another tribe or a person and another person. The Bible takes this and it adapts it to describe our relationship as people, as creation, with God. Maybe the best example of covenant that we might be able to think of that kind of makes it concrete for us is marriage, right? Two parties are bonded together. One lives for the other, right? There's this deep, permanent relationship between two people based on promises, basically. You, take promise, you make promises, vows, and you promise to fulfill them over the course of your life. That's how God enters into human reality, in a sense. He makes promises. They're not fulfilled right away. There's patience involved. But there's a relationship there. And once God makes those promises, he says, as long as you stay with me, you'll see these promises fulfilled. So this is basically the definition, if you will, of covenant, an agreement enacted between two parties in which one or both make promises under oath to either perform or refrain from certain actions stipulated. So I want to begin at the very beginning. So open your Bibles to Genesis 1. We're going to spend a lot of time in Genesis because as the name kind of suggests, the Genesis, the beginning, is describing our origins, basically, as a people, as a human people, as a people covenanted to God. So Genesis 1. Now, you probably have heard Genesis 1 before if you've ever attended the Easter Vigil, right? This great, great creation narrative. Now, what you may or may not know is that there are actually two creation narratives, right? We have two traditions here going on, two ways of telling the story of creation. The first, which I think I put on the outline there, Genesis 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 4. That's creation account number one. The second one is immediately following. Now, they all have different perspectives on God and on who we are in relationship to God. They have different accounts of the beginning of our relationship with God. So I want to look, we're not going to read all of these narratives, but I do want to start at the very beginning. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, 
you may have heard this before, right? In the beginning, it also begins the Gospel of John. Right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? John is actually being very creative there. He's saying there's a new beginning here, right? This is a new Genesis. This is something very new, but still a continuation. But moving on, verse 2 I, I find to be very interesting. The earth was without form or shape, with darkness over the abyss and a mighty wind sweeping over the waters. And what it says actually in Hebrew is there was tohu vavohu. It almost sounds like a vegan dish or something. There's tohu vavohu, which means utter chaos, emptiness, formlessness, void. It appears several times in the Bible, and it's actually a theme. It symbolizes the desert, right? It symbolizes this place where there's no real order. There's a lot of emptiness, a lot that can go wrong. And so what does God do? In verse 3, God said, let there be light. Let there be light. And with just a word that God speaks, really a phrase, God creates. We, of course, in the church believe that God created out of nothing, and that's not exactly what it says here. But we have good reason for believing that. We won't go into that, but he creates out of chaos, right? How does God create in this story? He brings order into something that is disordered. He brings order. We see that later because you know this story very well. God said, God said, God said, throughout six days, a six-day series. God said this, and it happened. God's word is effective. It's living. It brings into being. Of course, we know that as he creates the world, so to speak, this is just one perspective, again, on how he creates. We get to verse 24 of chapter 1. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth every kind of living creature, tame animals, crawling things, and every kind of wild animal. And so it happened. God made every kind of wild animal, every kind of tame animal, and every kind of thing that crawls on the ground. God said that it was good. That adjective, of course, is very important because there are many people throughout the history of salvation that think that creation is bad and that we have to escape it. Not so. The biblical mind is very much that creation is good. And then halfway through that, that paragraph, we get to the next verse. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image, after our likeness. We don't have to be alarmed there. It's not that there are three gods or four gods or many gods. In Hebrew, the word for God is plural for some odd reason. And so it's just agreeing in grammar, basically. We don't believe that there are more gods. Let us make human beings in our image. Man, woman, humanity, in some sense, is the apex of this creation. We're made in God's own image, which has ramifications for us, right? We'll go on to see that that's the reason we love each other. It's the reason we don't kill each other, do mean things to one another. But we're made in God's image. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame animals, all these things that God just created. And then it repeats to add emphasis. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then he blessed them. And then he said something very important. The first words of God to humanity in the Bible. It says, be fertile and multiply. Share this abundant blessing by multiplying, by filling the earth. Right? Creation, but especially human beings, are a blessing to the world. So we see that God, throughout this six-day creation story, 
We know on the seventh day God rests. He takes a Sabbath. This is order, right? Calendar order in this sense. But God, again, is putting order on something that was chaos. It was formlessness. It was void. It was tohu vavohu. And we'll want to remember that for when we talk about de-creation. Then we fast forward to chapter 2, right? Chapter 2, verse 4. It says, if you have a good Bible, it has these headings, and it says the Garden of Eden, right? This is the one that's especially familiar to us, because we hear it all the time, and many, many times it's so poorly interpreted. There are many people who take this as literal truth, and that's not at all what it's supposed to be. This is wisdom literature, basically. It's trying to teach us a lesson. This is the second narrative of creation, and if you read through it, which I hope you do after this session, you'll notice that it's very different than the first. Its aim is different. It's not talking about God creating order out of disorder, but it's talking about humanity and its interaction with God, right? Because we know the story. God plants this garden. He brings Adam out of the ground. Why is he named Adam? Does anyone know? No? Adam. Adam, because he comes from the Adama. In Hebrew, the word for ground is Adama. So you take Adam out of the ground. That's why his name is Adam. Eve gets the name Hawa. Hawa. It sounds like something on Star Wars or something. Hawa, which means mother of all the living. These are symbolic names. These are, very real sense, symbolic people. They represent all of us being created by God. So Adam, the man from the ground, and Eve, his wife, find themselves in the garden, matched up, right? Because they have to be fertile and multiply. And then we know in chapter 3, it kind of all goes south, right? Chapter 3, the heading I have, I don't know if you have this, but it says expulsion from Eden. We know it's because The serpent is there. Serpent that tempts Adam and Eve to eat the fruit. It doesn't say apple, but it's a fruit of some sort. And again, this is wisdom literature. This is actually not the first thing written in the Bible, right? It's the first thing we find in the Bible, but it's not the oldest thing in the Bible. This was a series of reflections, basically, probably around the time when the kings reigned in Israel. They were stories, they were like parables, basically expressing, when you think you are God, you've got it all wrong. When you think you can grab for whatever you want, you've got it all wrong. Because remember, God created the world to be an ordered world, not a disordered world. If you are not trusting God, then you've got it all wrong. We know that this whole story of Adam and Eve, especially in chapter 3, go to verse verse 9 of chapter 3. The Lord God then called to the man and asked him, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid, right? We remember the scene of paradise, really, in the chapter before. It's a scene of peace, of tranquility, of fruitfulness. And now all of a sudden, fear has been introduced into the scene. Then God asked, who told... Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. He sees something that he didn't see before. Then God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I had forbidden you to eat? And the man replied, scapegoating, the woman whom you put here. Remember, Adam wasn't asking, but God took his rib in the last chapter and made Eve. The woman whom you put here, God, 
She gave me the fruit, and so I ate it. And then God asked the woman. It's very interesting, right? It's the reality of sin in our own lives, right? When we find ourselves caught, probably one of the first things we want to do is say, it's not my fault. (laughs) It's your fault. If it's not your fault, it's God's fault, because he created you. The interesting thing, though, we know how the story goes, they're expelled from Eden. What does God not do? He doesn't kill them. He doesn't say, you transgressed this commandment. Now, off the face of the earth, let me start over. He works. God works with what's there. Here's our theme, creation, decreation, and God recreating. He expels, but he allows life to continue. We can think then in our own lives the times when we have introduced chaos into a world of order. When we, through our sins, through our selfishness, impose our own order on things rather than accept the order given by God, when we impose our own thoughts or our own opinions on other people without considering what they have to say, without hearing them first, this, in a sense, is sin. I want to move now. I call that the creation stories. In a sense, it's the first covenant. It's kind of the primordial covenant, right? Because God, as we've seen, has bonded himself to his people. Humanity, Adam and Eve. God created them with a purpose for flourishing. He created them in his own image. And so God has a plan that's taking a long time to be realized. And they're impatient and they grab and it goes south. So I call that the first covenant of the Bible, even though the word is not used. But let's move now to the first time it actually is used, and that, of course, is with Noah. So move to Genesis 6, beginning of chapter 6. Now here's another story that's been very, very poorly understood in the history of (laughs) Christianity. What we should know is that it's not unique, totally unique. There are many other stories in ancient Near Eastern literature around this time that have to deal with a flood, right? The gods are angry. The Babylonian gods are angry. Or this other culture's gods are angry. It's mythological language in a sense. What the Israelites did, what later Judaism would do when they edited these stories, is they took a lot of the structure of other stories, a lot of other flood narratives that look just like this, except they use their own theology. Instead of gods being angry, God is upset. The one God, because Israel believes in one God. They put their own theology into it, and you'll even notice that they put their own ritual symbolism into it. So let's read actually if we back up chapter 5 verses 29 and 30 when we actually are introduced to Noah verse 28 of chapter 5 reads when Lamech was 182 years old he begot a son and named him Noah saying, This one shall bring us relief from our work and the toil of our hands out of the very ground that the Lord has put under a curse. Remember, the ground was cursed after man and woman transgressed God's command. When Noah was 500 years old, he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now this is very interesting because Noah arrives kind of out of nowhere as this figure who is going to be giving relief, it says, relief from our work. Noah itself, the name means something like rest, relief. 
he ends up being the one righteous person on earth. Righteous being in right relationship with God. He is in right relationship with God. He is righteous before God. So fast forward a little bit to chapter 6, verse 6. Or 5, really. When the Lord saw how great the wickedness of human beings was on the earth, and how every desire that their heart conceived was always nothing but evil, the Lord repented or regretted. He repented making human beings on the earth, and his heart was grieved. Now, I don't know about you, but after having to study philosophy in the seminary, one thing that you learn about God is that he's unchanging, right? God is a God who is always God and doesn't change, but the Bible has very different vocabulary, very different structure of thought than philosophers or many theologians. God here looks to have many human emotions. God is grieved over his creation because his creation is not following the plan that will lead it to fulfillment. And so what does it say? God repents of having made creation. This is a way of saying that God is so upset with creation, he repents of even making creation. And so you see in the very next verse, number seven, so the Lord said, I will wipe out from the earth the human beings I have created. And not only the human beings, but also the animals and the crawling things and the birds of the air. For I regret, I repent that I made them. Now what's very interesting, at least for our purposes of creation and decreation, is the sequence here. If we were to go back to Genesis, what was the sequence in which these things were created? It's the reverse, right? God first created the birds of the air, and then the crawling things, and then the animals, and then the human beings. So Genesis, right here, is being very clever. It's a radical reversal of creation because of the introduction of chaos, of sin. It's like the negative of God's creation. And so they take the list and they move it backward a sign of de-creation. But then we learn in verse 8, but Noah found favor with the Lord. And this is really a pun. Noah, N-H, basically, in Hebrew, found favor, H-N, with the Lord. Noah, through and through, is a righteous man, backward and forward. N-H, H-N. They love to do this in Scripture. They love to pun. They love to have little jokes. That's why it's hard to access that sometimes if we're just reading it in English. But they're playing on words and they're having fun. So Noah found favor with the Lord. Then you know more or less the story, right? How many pairs of animals does Noah take into the ark? Two. Two. One pair. Eight. Yeah. Did you ever notice that there are two stories here woven together? In one story, it says he's to take two of all the living creatures. Chapter 6, number 19. Take two of all the living creatures. But then we see in chapter 7, verse 2, It says, take seven pairs of clean creatures and one pair of unclean creatures. What's been done here is that two different narratives, two ways of describing this have come together, right? They've kind of been merged together. And so the story that you learn in like Sunday school is like, oh, Noah took, you know, a pair of each animal onto the ark. Yeah, two by two. Well, that's one tradition, right? The other is that he took seven plus one. Seven pairs of clean and one pair of unclean. This is because when they're editing, 
when the final editor actually made this story, put it together, it was probably a priest, someone in Jerusalem, a priest who was concerned with ritual behavior. Seven, of course, being a, a very significant number, and clean and unclean things being very important for the priests. Right? And so they colored this narrative with their own ritual symbolism. But apparently they thought it important enough to keep the old one, too. So we have a story that doesn't seem to make sense when you read it just straight through. But these are two things together. That's just important to keep in mind in the Bible because there are many times when there are outright contradictions, right? Contradictions on the surface. It's not that the Bible is wrong. It's just that there are different ways of describing the reality. So that's the fun fact for the night. Although I have one more question. How many days did it rain? 40. 40 days and 40 nights. Except you go to chapter 7, verse 24. And then the waters, when the waters had swelled on the earth for 150 days. <laughs> they don't like to be consistent all the time. We in our, cult, our culture do, but they don't. Again, two stories coming together. But the important part that I want to focus on is the covenant in chapter 9. God blessed Noah and his sons. This is after, of course, the ark has found dry ground. They get out. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fertile and multiply. Where have we heard that before? And yeah, well, we're still in Genesis, but we heard it earlier in Genesis, right? In the creation story, God's first words to humanity, right? Share this blessing. Be fertile and multiply. And so it's being used here again as a kind of symbolic language that says, here's the blessing again. Be fertile, multiply, share it. Fear and dread of you shall come upon all the animals of the earth, probably including the serpent, right? And all the birds of the air, upon all the creatures that move about on the ground, and all the fishes of the sea, into your power they are delivered. Be fertile and multiply and have dominion. This is the third creation scene you might be able to say. This is actually a recreation, renewal of creation. The covenant, though, is very interesting. Where is that language? Starting with verse 8. God said to Noah, this is still in chapter 9, God said to Noah and to his sons with him, See, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the tame animals, and all the wild animals that were with you, and all that came out of the ark. I will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all creatures be destroyed by the waters of a flood. There's the promise. I'm not going to destroy the earth with a flood. That's the promise. But what's the sign of that promise? A rainbow. Except, in Hebrew, there's actually no word for rainbow. It's just bow. And what does that symbolize? It ends up sim symbolizing the covenant, but it's very much like a, an archery bow. God rests his bow, basically saying, no more chaos, right? I am not going to destroy you. I'm not in the business of destroying you. I created you so you would live. No more chaos. And so he rests his bow, basically using militaristic language, which is not uncommon in these cultures, He's resting his bow. This is a covenant of peace. No longer will I destroy the earth with a flood. His weapon, you might be able to say, is taking a Sabbath. God took a Sabbath in that second, first creation story, right? On the seventh day, he rested. Now, he's resting his bow. So what does this story say to us? Well, first of all, who is the dynamic character in this story. Hmm? You could say it. 
Is it Noah? It's God. Yeah. Noah's actually kind of boring in this story. <laughs> he just kind of does what he's told. Who is the one who's changing in the story? It's God, right? Remember before God repented of having made creation. God's heart was grieved. Noah's the static character. God is the dynamic character. He repents, and then he repents again because he makes that promise with them, the promise of not destroying them. So is this God a loving God? Yes. Does he stay with his creation? Yes. We learn that even from Adam and Eve. He didn't kill them right away. He stays with his creation. And now there's this irreversible change in God, this permanent change saying, I am with you 110%. He's got unlimited patience, you might even say. And again, God has emotions in the Bible. God was grieved. This is not something that we also always like to predicate of God, right? But it's very much there. And now who in this covenant is bound by an oath? It's God, yeah, which is so interesting because you would think that it would be the lesser party. That's certainly how most of the covenants of the old world would have worked, right? I'm the big, mighty superpower. You are this little tribe or this little nation. I'm the powerful one. You do what I say or I kill you. But God is the one who binds himself, not Noah, He says, I'm not going to destroy you. He binds himself to us, showing that he is with us 110%. And in addition, it shows how valuable creation really is. In a culture like ours, many times, as Pope Francis has said, we just throw things away, right? It's a throwaway culture. But the vision of the Bible is actually much more holistic. The vision of the Bible is that creation, hearkening back to that first creation story, is good. Human beings are very good. And God saved it all. So I want to move now to Abraham. We got a little dose of Abraham this past week. We can move to Genesis 12, very briefly. So we've had two covenants, creation itself, and then the covenant with Noah. Now it's time to enter the real nitty-gritty of Israel's history. Abraham, or Abram, as he starts out in chapter 12. Kind of out of nowhere, the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your land, your relatives, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. He's a nomad. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. You will be a blessing, not just have a blessing. You will be a blessing. And this is the really important part. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the families of the earth will find blessing in you. So here God is continuing his plan of salvation, right? He's continuing his plan of salvation through a particular person again. But not just for the person's sake, not just for Israel's sake, which in the Bible is not really created yet as a nation, as a people. It's for the sake of whom? All families of the earth, right? This universal blessing is to come through a particular, through Abraham. And what does Abraham do? He says, no, God, I'm old, I'm 75, I don't want to move. Probably his hip was giving him troubles by that time, but he couldn't get hip surgery. Bad knees, but if you have a map in your Bible, I do, um, he travels quite a bit. He travels from Ur of the Chaldeans, which is a sign of when this was written, because Ur of the Chaldeans did not exist 
when Abraham was alive. It's kind of a retrojection, projecting something back onto the past. But it gives us insight into when it was written, probably during the Babylonian exile. He moves kind of in an A shape, which is interesting, into the land of Canaan. So Abraham went as the Lord directed him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old. We have here, friends, a second call, basically. What was the first call in the Bible? It was creation, right? God spoke his word, and creation, in a way, responds by being created. This is the second call, you might say. And it's a call that is embraced. It's an embraced call. Abraham responds. He doesn't know where he's going. He he just believes God. He responds. He's got to have descendants, which he doesn't have yet. And he's got to have land. That's the promise. So let's move forward to Genesis 15 which is really the covenant part of this. This should sound familiar to you because we read it this past Sunday. We'll read the part that we didn't read. Sometime afterward, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not fear, Abraham. I am your shield. There's that weaponry again. I will make your reward very great. Now, this is where Abraham shows himself to be questioning, right? Abraham said, Lord God, what can you give me if I die childless and have only a servant of my household? Abraham continued, look, you have given me no offspring, so a servant of my household will be my heir, nothing from my own loins, my own flesh and blood. Then the word of the Lord came to him, No, that one will not be your heir. Your own offspring will be your heir. Do you see the problem here? How is he to be a nation that other nations will find blessing in if he doesn't have his own descendant? How is he to have land? How is he to become a nation with land if he doesn't have his own house in order, so to speak? He took him outside, and this is the echo from Sunday. He said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if you can. Just so, he added, will your descendants be. What did Abraham do? He put his faith in the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. There's that word again, righteousness. Right relationship with God is one of faith, right? Even when you don't see the results just yet, You put your faith in God, who you trust will eventually deliver. So God says to Abraham, okay, we're going to go into a trance now. And I'm not going to read that part because we read it on Sunday. But for those of you who weren't at 930, I kind of explained this a little bit. What does Abraham do? He cuts up the animals, right? The heifer. He doesn't cut up the birds. He spares them. But they're still dead. And he puts them half on one side, half on the other, right? Abraham is in a trance, though. He's in this kind of like dreamlike ecstasy state. And he sees this happening. Now, this is a way of making a covenant in the old world. Probably one of the oldest actions described in the Bible. A way of making a covenant. When you would make a covenant, both parties would step through the animals. The dead animals. And basically what that meant is that if I break this covenant, may I become like these animals. Right? And so what's interesting is here, in here, who steps through? When does Abraham step through? He doesn't, right? Who steps through? It's that flaming torch and smoking fire pot. God. God is the one who again binds himself. 
this time to Abraham, saying that I am going to fulfill this promise. And so God, in this symbolic way, is stepping through and taking the covenant curses upon himself. If he does not deliver, cursed may he be. That's what he's saying. God is the one stepping through. Just shows again how loving this God is. It's in strange language that we might not pick up right away. But if we study a little bit, we see just how far God will go. Binds himself by an oath to Abraham. Now what's very interesting though is that Abraham, is he a perfect figure? Abraham, for all this faith talk, does not have perfect faith, right? Just like many of us. We come to church on Sundays, we're good Catholics, but there are those days when we think, I can't do this anymore. I'm losing faith. I don't see any results. My family doesn't want to go to church. My kids hate me for going to church. Insert any of your faith problems there. But you're just like Abraham, in a sense, because just before this, right after he got the call, where did he go? He went down into Egypt, right? And he said, Sarah, you're a very beautiful wife, even at 75 or how old, or old she was at that point. You're very beautiful and I'm afraid. Abraham was afraid. He said, pretend to be my sister so that Pharaoh doesn't kill me because he'll want you for a wife. And Pharaoh is kind of the innocent one here. Abraham is saying, here, have her. He's afraid for himself. This is after he received his call from God, right? He shouldn't be afraid, but he is. Lack of faith. What happens after the passage we just read in 15? Chapter 16, the birth of Ishmael. Ishmael is not Sarah's son, right? That's Isaac. It's Hagar's son. Abraham is so desperate for an heir that he goes to a slave, Hagar, which was not the divine plan, right? Abraham's being tripped up. He's hedging his bets, you might say, saying, just in case God doesn't deliver. But in the end, we know Abraham is faithful. So even with these slip-ups of faith, you might say, he puts his trust in the Lord, and it's credited to him as, an, as righteousness, as right relationship. Abraham was open to God, right? Just as we are called to be open to God. Abraham, too, don't forget that blessing part. He's a blessing for all the families of the earth. That's extremely important because Abraham is called to live in right relationship, not just with God, but with everyone he encounters. And that's something that Jesus will end up calling us back to in the gospel, right? It's not just about going to the temple and doing the sacrifices and being in right relationship with God. It's about being in right relationship with one another, which is a good segue to our next covenant, which is the one at Sinai, Horeb. If you turn to Exodus 20, let's say. We'll leave Genesis behind and go to Exodus. Exodus 20 should sound very familiar to you. It's the Ten Commandments. Now here, as we arrive at Sinai, we're skipping a lot, right? We're skipping the slavery in Egypt. We're skipping the Exodus out of Egypt through the Red Sea, the Reed Sea, actually. It's called. But this is really the primary covenant. It's not the first in the Bible, but it's the primordial one, aside from creation, right? But this is the creation of a people, a people that was freed from slavery. Now, what's interesting about covenantal language, especially in the ancient Near East, the time period we're dealing with, is that it starts with a kind of historical prologue right? Power number one and power number two. Power one would say, this is what I've done for you. I am power number one, and I saved you from the hands of these enemies over here. That's how they would usually start. What do we see 
in Exodus 20. Then. then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not have other gods beside me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, etc., etc. It's the same covenantal language, right? I am the one who saved you from oppression. I am the one who brought you to this place to make of you a nation. I am the one who has accomplished all this from the beginning of creation until now. And so what does he do? He gives the Torah, the law. Really, it's instruction, not so much regulations as it is instruction about how to live in right relationship, in righteousness. And so you can say that this covenant, the covenant at Sinai, or the covenant of Horeb, the other name for Sinai, if you were a trivia night a couple weeks ago, there was a question on which mountain Moses died on. And it was multiple choice, and two of the responses were Sinai and Horeb. So if you know your Bible, you can do well at trivia night, because you could have eliminated those right away. They're the same mountain. In Deuteronomy, it's called Horeb. In Exodus, it's called Sinai. It's Mount Nebo, by the way, the mountain that Moses died on. We got it right. So did Father Presta. Good work, Father Preston. But this covenant, what is this covenant about? Noah was about preservation, about keeping with creation. Abraham was about blessing all of the nations. Here, this is a manifestation of God's righteousness. It's the essence of the covenant. It's not just about the regulations. What are the regulations for, though? What is the instruction for? It's for teaching the people how to live in right relationship, not just with God, that's the first few lines, but with others. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not, you shall not. These are ways of living in right relationship with one another. A society that does not oppress is a society that follows this instruction. So God is saying, I freed you from oppression. Don't do it to other people. Do not turn back to Egypt and become like Pharaoh. Do not, do not, do not. Don't be oppressors. You were oppressed. Do not be oppressors. Now, if you fail to live this out, the covenant is in jeopardy. If you fail to live in righteousness, that's a broken relationship. This covenant fidelity means that you are living as a moral person. But you're in a personal relationship with this God who created you, and in, in a personal relationship with other members of this new family. Then, of course, we get to Exodus 24. Everything in between, basically these laws and instructions, right, on the covenant. You get to Exodus 24, though. And what does it say of the heading? It's the ratification of the covenant. If you were to read this, you'd be very thankful that we have Catholic Mass and not Exodus 24. Because what is Moses doing? He writes down all the words it says in, in verse 4. Verse 6, here we go. Moses took half the blood of the animal. He took half the blood and put it in large bowls. The other half he splashed on the altar. Taking the book of the covenant, he read it aloud, like the liturgy of the word. And all the people answered, all that the Lord has said we will do. We want to live in right relationship. And then he took the blood and he splashed it on the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Does that sound familiar? It should, right? Because what is our new covenant ritual? It's a ratification of what Christ has done for us. Take this, all of you, drink from it. We're not going to splash it on you. You get to drink it. The second part of this ratification ceremony, they eat, right? It's a meal ritual. They share. They belong to the same family. They have a meal together. 
This, of course, is a great foreshadowing, or at least a great appropriation of this Old Testament structure once the New Testament comes around. Jesus knows what he's doing, right? He knows his scripture. He reappropriates this and said, this is the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. The blood that is shed is the blood that you drink in the Eucharist. Now, of course, we know that a lot of Pharisees and people like that in the gospel are not really righteous people. They're self-righteous people, right? They go around saying, up, up, you're not fulfilling the law of Moses. You're not doing exactly as the letter says. What does Jesus say? It's love. It's mercy. If you're just sticking to the letter and not the spirit of the law, you've missed the entire point of the Sinai covenant, of the covenant at Horeb. You've missed the entire point. Because if you are oppressing someone else, you are missing the point. Oppressing them by a law or oppressing them by an economic structure a political structure, whatever. You are not being faithful to the covenant. To be faithful to the covenant is to act as God acts, in mercy and in love. And so we'll finish with the covenant with David, which we can talk about very briefly. It's in 2 Samuel. Now that's a pretty big leap forward. So there's... Joshua, Judges, Samuel, 1 Samuel, and then 2 Samuel. Now, if you happen to go to Mass today, this passage should be very familiar to you because we celebrate what today? St. Joseph. And St. Joseph, the first reading is the covenant to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, today at the seminary, we read this, but because it's a solemnity, we used incense. And as they were walking in, about two seconds after they started from the back, what went off but the fire alarm? Because the incense. We had a bishop with us today, as a matter of fact, and the fire alarm didn't go off until about the second reading. So we had someone screaming up there, Second Samuel 7, at the top of their voice, but being drowned out by this loud fire alarm. So the moral of the story is don't use incense at a daily mass. But he did scream it, and we heard a little bit of it. But just to refresh your memory, you all heard it if you came today. 2 Samuel 7, it's an oracle from Nathan the prophet to David. After the king had taken up residence in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from his enemies on every side, the king said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. Nathan answered the king, Whatever is in your heart, go and do, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell David my servant. Thus says the Lord, is Is it you who would build me a house to dwell in? I have never dwelt in a house from the day I brought Israel up from Egypt to this day but I have been going about in a tent or a tabernacle. As long as I have wandered about among the Israelites, did I ever say a word to you, to any of the judges whom I commanded to shepherd my people? Why have you not built me a house of cedar? No. Now then, speak thus to my servant David. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, because he was a shepherd, remember, from following the flock, to become a ruler over my people Israel. I was with you wherever you went, and I cut down all your enemies before you. Later, I will assign a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them to dwell there. They will never again be disturbed, nor shall the wicked ever again oppress them as they did at the beginning. I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. Here's a little pun again. It's not building a house, right? It's building a lineage, a dynasty. I will make a house for you. I will make a house for you when your days have been completed and you rest with your ancestors, so his descendants. 
and I will raise up your offspring after you, sprung from your loins, and I will establish his kingdom. He it is who shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the royal throne forever. There's the promise. It's basically a little divine charter. God saying that I will give you a shepherd. And we know that the history of Israel is pretty colored, checkered, right? Very quickly, they show themselves not to be shepherds, but princes, kings. What's the hallmark of kingship, though, in the eyes of God? It's to live the Mosaic covenant, right? To teach the Mosaic covenant. You're not a king unless you're teaching, as it says in Deuteronomy, the king has his Torah, he sits on the throne, and the Torah is on his lap because he's teaching the people how to live in right relationship with the Lord. This is authentic kingship, not the kingship that we read about later because we know Solomon and many other kings after that turned to other gods, to the pagan gods, instead of the god who set them free from oppression. And then they, in turn, become oppressors. Those, friends, are the covenants of the Old Testament. There's one that I'm leaving out, but I'm going to talk about it next time, the New Covenant, of course. But this, I hope, gives us a structure of what God intended. He intended creation. It's good. He intended to stay with creation, even when creation did not want to stay with him. He intended for that creation and all its peoples to be blessed through this nation Abraham would create. But he intended that nation to live as a nation that is peculiar because it's not like the other nations that live in disorder. They live in order, the order of the Torah, the instruction of right relationship. They show the world how to live. And of course, the king is supposed to shepherd those people in living that right relationship. So these are the covenants of the Old Testament. This is the creation segment. Next week, just a little preview. I know on your outline I put some passages. If you want to read those in between now and then, that would probably be good. Um, they're works from the prophets. If you're looking for something to read or pray with, that's a great way to prepare for the decreation part of, of uh, the mission. I just want to end uh, with a prayer. You don't have to turn there, but I will. Psalm 104, which is also a psalm of creation, one that we hear as well on the Easter Vigil. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are great indeed. You are clothed in majesty and splendor, robed in light as with a cloak. How varied are your works, Lord. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, great and wide. It teems with countless beings, living things both large and small. All of these look to you to give them food in due time. When you give it to them, they gather. When you open your hand, they are well filled. When you hide your face, they panic. Take away their breath, they perish, and they return to the Adama, the dust. So Lord, send forth your spirit. Recreate us and renew the face of the earth. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.